everyone. So today I want to talk about uh, real-time data analytics and how you can do that uh, in the cloud, specifically in AWS. Now, before I wanted to get started with that, um, I wanted to mention I'm always excited to be at open source conferences. And one of the reasons for that is um, that we talk about free software. And I wanted to quote Richard Stallman. Some of you might know him. He's a funny looking guy with a long beard. He's a founder of the Free Software Foundation and also the GNU project. And he said something that I find very interesting and I just quote him on that one, which is when we speak of free software, we, speak, we are referring to freedom and not price. And this is a really important matter because when it's open source, that doesn't mean it's cheap or free. What really matters is that we're free to look at the code, that we're free to change what we can do with that piece of software. That is why we're looking at open source. Now on that matter, how does open source actually fit into the data analytics space? And some of you might be familiar with it. There's a yellow little elephant called Hadoop, uh, which is an open source project. Um, it's actually an open source project that was created um, by two software engineers at Yahoo. And they based that project on a paper that was released by Google. <laughs> so that's a funny story about it. Um, what is Apache Hadoop? Well, it's basically an open source project that allows you to have distributed compute cluster and distributed storage. Now this is very interesting because it allows you to do it on commodity hardware. Why does it allow you to do that? Well, in the older days, running a, an expensive compute cluster um, was not easy. If a node fails, your cluster goes down, etc. So the concept of Hadoop was to say, if a node fails, I don't care because it's distributed and it recovers. And that is the idea behind Apache Hadoop. Started off with the first version, which was pure what they call map reduce. Nowadays, it's actually used much more just to maintain nodes within your cluster. And when I say nowadays, it's mostly used not in the map reduce paradigm. That really is based on the fact that there's an entire open source ecosystem that has been built on top of Apache Hadoop. I'm not going to go through this list, but I just wanted to give you an idea. These are some of the popular projects that are on top, uh, that are built on top of Apache Hadoop. A few one you might have heard, like Spark or Mahout, Pick, Scoop, etc. And all those projects have been built on top of Hadoop for one reason: you don't need to care about fault tolerance anymore. It is handled through the Apache Hadoop framework. Now this is great. So we're talking always about big data. So I wanted to just dissect that a little bit further. Um, when we talk about big data, people generally refer to the three Vs. Um, some, some companies say four Vs. The overall standard is three Vs, which stands for volume, velocity, and variety. Well, what does that mean? We generally create more and more data at a higher, faster frequency, at a faster pace. And the data that we're creating or that we're storing is not just in the older days, it used to be database tables. Now it can be anything from a JSON format to some IoT sensor device that is sensing some data points that get streamed in. So we have lots of different data that we're now managing. I wanted to back that up with one little slide. This slide is two years old. So imagine these numbers to have probably doubled or tripled. So this is an example of what happens in 60 seconds in the internet. And just to give you a few ideas, in every 60 seconds, we have 168 million emails that are being sent out. We have over half a million, 695,000 Facebook status updates every 60 seconds. Um, other interesting things, 1,700 downloads of Firefox every 60 seconds, quite impressive. And another one which I think really goes into the big data space because we talk about large volumes, YouTube. Every 60 seconds, over 600 new videos that get uploaded and transcoded. That is why we're referring to it as big data. And if you look at a data analytics lifecycle, it generally translates into four stages. You generate data, obviously, then you collect it, you store it, you want to analyze it and process it, compute something on it, and then you want to get your insights out of it, collaborate, share it across. Now, probably everybody has a smartphone in his pocket and a tablet at home and a laptop on the desk and maybe 
some other IoT devices, which really um, creates the big data problem because we got more and more devices. It's lower in cost to produce data. These days, you easily have a 100 megabit internet connection where you can push lots of data through. In all the days, you had to dial up on the modem. So that creates a very high throughput in data generation. But the problem that we had in the older days still exists. When it comes to storing data, when it comes to computing data, there was not much difference. We're still highly constrained in doing so. What do I mean with that? Let's have a little bit of a look how cloud computing providers, such as Amazon Web Services, can actually help remove some of those constraints. Um, so if you look at big data, you break it down. First of all, okay, we understand it's big, it's massive, massive data sets. Well, if you run on a cloud provider, you generally have unlimited amount of capacity. So AWS doesn't restrict you in terms of storage, in terms of compute uh, that you require, and you can request it at any point in time. And that brings me to the point of how does data analytics generally work? Um, sometimes I talk to customers and they say, okay, I wanna create this big data project, and when I'm done, then I get all the insights. As a matter of fact, it's not like that. You produce something, you try it out, you realize it's not good, you refine it, you refine it, you keep on refining it. It's an experimental nature of what you're doing. And you also want to have an underlying infrastructure that allows you to do that. In a cloud environment, you have on-demand infrastructure. I need a thousand servers to simulate something for an hour, I can do it, and later I just throw it away. The other part is, especially in the internet days, something goes viral and you suddenly have a massive amount of traffic going against your system. This happens all the time, and I'll give you a few examples later on. Um, again, here, if you have a scalable infrastructure where you say, within minutes, I can scale up to any kind of capacity, then that's great. And AWS is designed in exactly that manner. We are happy to have this variable kind of peak loads, valleys, and peaks, etc. cetera. Um, another thing which really goes into the variety part of big data is that you have different formats, structured, unstructured data, um, JSON format, some comma separated files, etc. You generally want to have tools and services. Whoops, that was one click to create. Tools and services that allow you to handle structured and unstructured data, and sometimes even semi structured data. And also, and this is where I want to head towards to stream data, if you stream in data and operate on it. So, if we talk about data analytics, generally there are three types. The first one is what most people get started with, retrospective analysis and reporting. What happened in the past? Look at all the data that I collected and understand what happened in the past, create a report out of it, and make decisions, get insights out of it. <clears throat> the next step is to say, well, this is great, but I want this to be faster. I want this to be here and now, in real time, I want to know what's going on on my website, what's going on with my mobile application, what are all my IoT devices sensing out there in real time. And then out of that, the next step is to say, now I know what happened in the past, I know what happens now, I want to know what happens in the future. And that is the predictive space, the machine learning space that allows you to enable smart applications and predict things before they happen. Now what we're going to talk about today is the here and now, the real-time dashboard, and how we do that. Now, first of all, when I say real-time, what do I mean with real-time? And I want to quote uh, the CTO of Silicon Valley Data Science. Um, his name is John Ackert, and he, he said, there's no such thing as real-time, there's only near real-time. And typically, when people talk about real-time, what they actually mean is architectures that allow you to respond to data without persisting it to a database first. And this is really important because we need to understand what real time means. So what does it really mean? Well, it means that you want to have the ability to process large amounts of data as they arrive into your environment. So roughly speaking, this means you want to process data in the present rather than in the future. This future is not good, that is too slow. But what is the present? I'll give you a few examples. Um, Amazon Web Services also has another small business called Amazon.com, which is our retail business, an e-commerce platform. Um, if we talk about an e-commerce platform, what is present? What does really matter? Well, the attention span of my customer. 
If, I, if it takes me one second to process it, that's still fine because people don't really click in milliseconds through your website. They look at something, they click on it, they read through it, they make a decision, they click at the next thing. That is what is real time for you. You can easily take a few seconds to process it. What about an options trader? I'm actually based in Hong Kong. There are lots of options traders there, people who create clever algorithms to do arbi arbitrage in the financial markets. Here, we often talk about milliseconds. If I don't buy and sell that option quick enough, I might lose a lot of money. Think about in the military space, if you have a guided missile that we send out, here sometimes microseconds can make a difference. So the present is defined by your use case, what you're doing. Don't just always think real time needs to be as fast as possible. No, it doesn't. It just needs to be as fast to what you require for your use case. And as a matter of fact, most of you are probably in the space where e-commerce would sit, where you say real time for me means a few seconds response time. Now, what is the solution to that? Generally, you want to have what is referred to as a stream processing event engine, or sometimes also referred to as stream storage, which allows you to process data as it comes in. So you plug in your applications into that stream storage before you even persist it into a database. So what do we expect from such real-time data streams, from such a stream storage? <clears throat> Generally, you expect a few things. You want it to be highly available, always there, scalable to any kind of amount of people that are using it. Uh, you want it to be fault tolerant. You don't want to lose data. And you want it to be durable, at least temporarily, long enough for you to interact with that data. Now, if you do that at a large scale, you'll find that, well, you need to build a lot of data centers for that. You will have server infrastructure that needs to scale at a very quick pace. You probably need some global load balancer if you actually have an application that spans globally. And that's obviously a lot of heavy lift and shift. You don't want to do that. Um, and this is the reason um, why a cloud service provider like Amazon Web Services is interesting. Because we provide you that global infrastructure for you to consume at any point in time. So we get 11 regions across the world. You see them here on the map. And we continuously expand on those regions. The latest ones are Frankfurt in Germany and Beijing in uh, China. We also have an interesting concept here, which is called availability zones. An availability zone is a cluster of data centers within a region. So if you look at a region, let's say Tokyo, for example, within the Tokyo region, we got three availability zones. Now, those availability zones are clusters of data centers that are on separate power grids, separate network connectivity, separate tier one internet service providers that we peer and are connected with. What that means is if you run an application that runs in multiple of those availability zones, you have a highly available application. Because even if a complete data center fails, if a complete power grid goes down, it would only affect one of those availability zones. And that's quite useful when we talk about scalability, when we talk about fault tolerance of such a stream storage. In addition to that, also 53 edge locations as network entry points for your stream storage, um, including content delivery and uh, DNS resolution. So let's dissect this a little bit further. When we talk about Amazon Web Services, some of you might say, well, it's cloud. But why do we call it Web Services? Well, because everything is an API, a RESTful API with an Amazon Web Services. Everything can be addressed programmatically and through the help of software development kits like SDKs. Everything sits on top of that global infrastructure, that green bar that you see here, the regions, the availability zones. Um, obviously, a certain security layer in between that allows you to control access, know what's going on within your services, audit them. And then on top of that, we build the value app. This is what you should be interested in, in terms of core and platform services. Core services, think virtual servers, databases, storage components, networking components. But the more interesting part is platform services that add value straight away without you needing to manage a server, for example. These are the platform services. And here specifically, we got the analytics space. And this is what I want to dive into um, today.
So let's try to simplify big data a little bit with AWS. Um, again, what is big data? What is data analytics? Over a period of time, we have an influx of data and we want to answer questions. In between, there are different phases. The ingest phase, get data into your system, store it, process it, and then visualize it, get your insights out of that data. If you map that out into kind of open source projects and services that Amazon would offer, it would look like this. So in the ingest phase, we have open source tools like Flume, Fluentd, Log4j that allows you to rotate your log files into a storage environment. Um, we also got specific services like Amazon Mobile Analytics that can be included in your mobile app to collect all the information what's going on. Eventually, you're then going to store it. And when you store data, there are different kind of storage environments and systems. Um, and this depends on things like data complexity and data temperature, what you're going to choose. Um, in this scenario, you generally have databases, so relational databases like Amazon RDS, NoSQL, non-relational databases like Amazon DynamoDB, things like Amazon S3, which is a um, object storage where you can put in your data and you can scale to any amount of capacity here. Uh, Kinesis, which is our real-time event processing stream, and I'm going to demo that in just a bit. Search indexes or even archival services. Eventually, you then want to process your data. So here we talk about things like Hadoop. So in Amazon, this would be EMR, Elastic MapReduce. Uh, Redshift, which is a data warehouse, so you can talk to it in SQL language. Uh, go up to petabyte scale of data. Um, very interesting one, Amazon Lambda. I'm going to talk about that in just a bit. Um, it's basically a new compute service that we have. And eventually, you then want to visualize that data. So here you want to leverage on some open source tools. Uh, Pentaho is an interesting one. Kibana, I'm going to demonstrate that in just a bit. All visualization libraries like D3. And also a little call out here. The first icon is the AWS Marketplace. So if you run something on AWS, we have something called Marketplace, which allows you to, with a click of a button, have software pre-installed onto your service. In addition to that, if it's a commercial product, because sometimes we still need to use commercial products, that you even get those software licenses at an hourly rate. So that's quite attractive if you want to try a commercial product without buying that yearly expensive license. Now let's try to zoom in a little bit. So let's start with the ingest phase. How do you get started? Most of you run web servers, application servers, and most of you collect log files, or at least their server does. Now what do we do with those log files? We generally need to log rotate them somewhere in a central space. One tool that can really help here is called Fluentd, which is an open source data collector. So it can go into uh, multiple of, uh, data sources, so think any kind of logs like app logs, syslogs, etc., or even integration like Twitter, for example. And then it can move that to a central storage space. That central storage space can be something like an Elasticsearch appliance, or it can also be something like um, a service from Amazon. So we have direct integration into our storage service called S3, and also into our real-time processing engine called Kinesis. Um, if I want to log rotate um, log files into a storage service, it would be as simple as this little source code that you see here, where I take Apache log files, and I basically just rotate them into an S3 bucket. Fluentd does the rest for me. Right? So you can have many, many, many different servers, and they all log rotate back into that S3 bucket. Great open source project. You find it on github.com slash fluent slash fluentd, which is the fluentd demo. Now, how about stream storage? Amazon Kinesis is an interesting service here. So what it does is it gives you a service that has distributed streams that scale to virtually any amount of capacity and throughput that you want to have that goes through that stream. Um, this can be millions of events per second. No problem, Kinesis can handle that. The more important part though, and this is what this talk is about today, is you can react in real time upon the events that come into that stream. It's fully managed in terms of 
that it's highly available because it's replicated across three facilities. So whenever you throw something into that stream, this is replicated into three different data centers within the region of your choice. Now, let's give you, let me give you an example here. Um, I'm not sure if anybody of you plays this game. It's called Clash of Clans. It's uh, from a Finnish game developer called Supercell. And it's basically these guys here that have swords and you have villages and you run around and you go raid other people's villages. And they're actually quite popular. They've been number one in the App Store for over two years in a row um, in certain countries. Now, how did they achieve that? Well, basically, they have very good user retention rates, meaning that people that start playing the game, they generally play it for a very long time and never stop. Now, this is not very good luck. This is no magic. No, they actually have a very clever data science team behind this that understands how people play the game. So what they do is, whenever you play that game, you touch the character, you move him around, all these events are sent into an Amazon Kinesis stream. Now they archive all that data and they run models on top of it. And they created a model that allows you to understand churn rates, so on a churn likelihood. How likely is a user that he stops playing the game? And they found that if you do certain actions, if you go to this village and you do that, then you do that, then you're more likely to stop playing the game. So how are they using Amazon Kinesis? Well, all the events that are being streamed in into the Kinesis stream, they evaluate it against their model that they created. And they then predict a likelihood of churn, a value between zero and one, which defines he's very likely to stop playing the game or he's not, he continues to play the game. If he's very likely to stop playing that game, what they do is they send a free goodie back to the end user, a free new sword, a free new helmet, a free new character. And that's funny because if you, stop, if you play that game and you suddenly get something new, you're like, oh, that's interesting. Let me continue to play a little bit, right? So a great way to keep your users on the platform. When I said big data, just to give you a bit of an idea, this game alone is creating four terabytes of log data every day just on this in-game events, which they push through their Kinesis stream. Um, you would say this is a lot of data. Is this really worth it? Yes, it is. Because if you keep your users on a platform and your, your gaming company, every user counts because he's the one who's driving your revenue. Now, how does it work? Well, it's a stream you can ingest from multiple sources. Remember, everything is an API, so you can use RESTful APIs, HTTP posts, you can use software development kits, you can use some open source tools like Flume, Fluentd, which we talked about, and we also give you some uh, libra producer libraries to allow to ingest data. Behind that, you can then put your algorithms, your aggregation, your metric extractions. And I'm going to show a demo on where we do this with a live Twitter feed to aggregate hashtags. So uh, let's stay tuned on that part. Um, by the way, all the um, AWS integrators, connectors, SDKs, we share them uh, open source under Apache License 2.0. So you find them uh, in AWS Labs, so github.com slash AWS Labs. Uh, highly recommended if you're an Amazon user. You find lots of interesting stuff there, including some of those connectors I'm going to demonstrate. Now, when we talk about processing, another very interesting one uh, project is called Apache Spark. Um, became really popular because it's an in-memory analytics data cluster, much faster than traditional Hadoop MapReduce. Why? Because it has something that is called RDD, Resilient Distributed Data Sets which basically allows you to build up a cluster completely in memory and do your calculation. Very fast, cost effective, and fault tolerant. As a matter of fact, if we talk about Amazon Kinesis, Apache Spark streaming can directly read from that Kinesis stream to understand what's going on. Give you an idea how easy that can look like. You do something like Kinesis Utils, you look at the stream, you just give the name, and then you could say, well, filter all the incoming events filter those which have open source and do that in a window period of every five seconds to aggregate them, to understand, oh, who's, who's tweeting about open source, for example. With one command line, 
we get it done through such a great open source project. Spark, very interesting, a big favorite of myself. So how about processing though? Um, there's a service that we recently launched um, about half a year ago, which is called Amazon Lambda. And I wanted to highlight this to you because I think it's very interesting when we talk about doing things in real time. So what Amazon Lambda allows you to do is to say you can push your code into an Amazon Lambda function. And we do the rest for you in terms of managing the underlying infrastructure. So you don't manage code. Well, there you go. You don't manage code. You don't manage any servers. And also not security. So you wouldn't see things like this. There you go. Which is great because when we talk about something online, we talk about potentially massive scale that happens in very short bursts. If you build your own server infrastructure, this means that you need to build your own auto scaling groups, you need to build your own machine images, etc. All of this is possible, but this service takes care for you of that. As a matter of fact, there's something that's much cooler. Um, you can react upon events. So apart from only invoking that code through an API call, which is what you would expect, right? Like the web server that you're calling. Um, you can also react upon state changes. This is interesting because if you use another service, let's say S3, which is our storage service, if you dump a log file into it, that can trigger an event change. That event change can trigger your Lambda function. That Lambda function could take the log file, aggregate it, load it into your data warehouse. Another state uh, transition would be on your database. Somebody writes a new item into your database table, triggers a Lambda function, and you do something with it. And what we're going to try today is we can also connect it to an Amazon Kinesis stream. So whenever there's data that comes into that stream, we react upon it. What will we do? Well, we write our own code into that function. Right now, we support Java and JavaScript. And when I say it's really interesting for you, it's also for a reason of cost effectiveness. Um, so we charge you per execution time of that code. There's a, that's a big difference. So that doesn't mean that you need to pay per hour for service that you don't use. If that function is not executed, it costs you nothing. If it's executed, you only pay for what your code is being executed for, which gives you an incentive to write effective code. Um, in addition to that, we give you 3.2 million seconds, not milliseconds, seconds for free every month in terms of execution time. So very useful um, to execute code in real time. Um, and when I say I talked about a database that could trigger such a Lambda function, um, another interesting service is called Amazon DynamoDB, which is basically a managed NoSQL database. NoSQL, non-relational, meaning no schema. You can put in items of different kind of formats, great for the big data space, um, but it's fully managed service. So you create a table and we care about the rest. So you don't need to worry about a server. You don't need to worry about scaling. Scaling generally translates into data partitioning, sharding, da da da. A lot of stuff that is actually difficult to manage that you don't want to do. So what DynamoDB does for you, it does that. Uh, this sharding, this partitioning, all of this is under the hood. You just have one table and you can write to it as much as you want. No limitations in terms of storage, no limitations in terms of throughput. You need a million writes per second, no problem. DynamoDB can handle it. And you are charged on that throughput. So if you don't use much, if you say I use one write per second, five writes per second, then it's very cheap. And you can change that at any point in time. So if you need 10 writes per second now and a thousand a second later, you just tell it to DynamoDB and it scales that for you. Um, one good example of this is uh, Shazam. So sometimes in my free time, I appreciate you know, DJing around in some bars in Hong Kong. And this is a very useful tool for me because I can build up my playlists. You know Shazam? It's a cool app. You have it on your mobile phone, and then you can listen to a music that is playing, and it will tell you the name. So what I do, I go into all kinds of bars. Oh, this is good. All right. Huh? This is good. good. Great. Now my playlist is done. So this is what Shazam is doing. It's an Israeli-based startup, and it became really, really popular. They are using DynamoDB. Just to give you an idea, they have 500,000 writes. That's half a million writes per second 
all the time on DynamoDB tables. That's the kind of scale that they're doing. And another interesting fact is during Super Bowl, which is a major American event, they actually, a lot of people are using it to listen to the songs, and they need to have an additional 200 servers just to do the fingerprinting of the song itself. But the good news in terms of a cloud environment, which is the relevant takeaway for you here, is straight after, they go back to zero of those additional servers. And this is very useful when you use something like a Hadoop framework. Because in a cloud environment, you say, I pay per hour, which means if I run one server for 100 hours, it's the same price than 100 servers for one hour. And given the linear scalability of a processing framework like Hadoop, I achieve the same result for the same price, but at a faster rate, because I don't care about capacity anymore. So how about another cool open source tool? Um, to start visualizing data. Um, there's one that I find quite attractive. It's called Kibana. What is Kibana? It's basically an open source project um, that was launched now being uh, procured by Elastic.io, so it's part of Elastic.io these days. Um, and it allows you to visualize data in a browser environment. You can build your own dashboards. Um, you can filter within those, those log files that you have. And it's relatively fast. Why? Because it's using an indexing engine of your data underneath. What is that indexing engine? Open source code. It's based on Apache Lucene. And if you ever heard of Elasticsearch or Solar, S-O-L-R, they are all based on Apache Lucene, which is the indexing engine that lies underneath. Kibana, as a matter of fact, is actually using Elasticsearch to perform this. Um, in addition to that, I talked about Hadoop. So if you need massive scale, if we talk about big data, well, you can also use Elasticsearch on top of Hadoop with an ES Hadoop extension. You guessed it, open source, of course, so you can look at what's going on. GitHub.com slash Elastic slash Kibana. That's where you find the tool and contribute it uh, to it. The current version is the 4.0 version, which looks like what you see here. So. Now you're gonna tell me, okay, Ollie, that's a lot of nice talking and fancy words. Does that actually work? So let, let's try this out with a demo. So what I'm gonna try to do, it's live, so if it breaks, don't blame me. Um, I wanna tap onto a Twitter stream. Um, Twitter, uh, this is a 2013 uh, blog post, so probably it's much more these days. You have about 500 million tweets sent every day. I know Twitter is not that popular here in Taiwan, um, in the US, they love it, and they're probably generating a lot of those tweets. Um, but why am I choosing Twitter? Because it's a perfect example of, I have lots of transactions per second. As a matter of fact, Twitter has about 5,700 tweets per second in average, meaning that most of the time, it might even be much higher than that. That's a lot of data that streams in. So what we're gonna try to do is, we're gonna push that into an Amazon Kinesis stream, which is our managed stream from Amazon. Behind that, we want to react upon it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a Lambda function behind that Kinesis stream. This Lambda function looks at the tweets, looks for a hashtag, and then starts aggregating that hashtag because I want to know what people are tagging about. And then I'm going to put those hashtags into a NoSQL database. I'm going to put it into DynamoDB, where I basically just count the amount of hashtags that have been tweeted. To then, you know, make sense out of it, I'm going to start visualizing it. For this, I'm using a JavaScript visualization library, D3GS, another open source project, really cool. Um, and I'm, I'm going to do that in browser, so I'm going to serve up um, that JavaScript code from an S3 bucket, because S3 is a storage service that also allows you to have files publicly as an endpoint. So it can become your static web server for things like JavaScript. In addition to that, I have another Lambda function that taps onto the same stream and indexes it into an Elasticsearch appliance. And then I can connect Kibana to it, which allows me to visualize what's going on. So let's try um, this in a live demo. Is this mic working? Perfect.
list. Go into my browser. So basically what you see here is the Amazon Web Services Management Console. I can zoom in a little bit. And you'll, you'll see that we have a bunch of different services, some of them which I elaborated on just now. So what we're going to try to use here um, is Lambda, where I'm going to write my code inside to respond upon the incoming events that have been streamed into the Kinesis live feed. So what I did, I created the Kinesis stream. I called it Twitter demo stream. And then the next thing I did, I created two Lambda functions, one which I called Twitter demo react and one which I called Twitter demo elastic search. Um, let's have a look at one of those functions. Let's have a look at Twitter demo elastic search. Is my internet working? Yes, it is. I just got logged out. There we go. So this is the way you operate a Lambda function. You can write your code in line or you can say I upload the zip file. Um, what we're doing here is I created a very small function that says um, create a handler that uh, looks at the incoming events and for every event, for each records of these events, uh, look at what's coming into that stream. In that stream we actually have a tweet, right, because I'm ingesting tweets in it. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to you know, count, find the hashtags, sorry, which you see here, I'm filtering by hashtags, and then I'm going to index them into my Elasticsearch uh, appliance, which you see down here. I'm putting it in, um, and that's it. That's basically all that my Lambda function is doing here. Now, how do I create that connection between the Kinesis stream and this Lambda function? Here under event sources, I can click and say, I want to have a new event source, and then I can uh, uh, look at different services here. For example, Kinesis, which is what I'm doing here. I connected this to the Kinesis stream, the Twitter demo stream, so that every time there's new tweets coming in into my Kinesis stream, this Lambda function is executed. The second function, and I'm not going to show it to you in detail now um, uh, because of the sake of time, is the one that writes it into a DynamoDB table when it's counting those hashtags. So let's try if this actually works. Let me just enable the Twitter stream into Kinesis first. So what I can do in the Twitter API, I can listen to certain keywords. So I'm going to try a few things. I'm going to listen to um, money. Money is always good. Lots of people tweet about money. Everybody wants more money. Um, and then maybe another one. Let's try Costco. That's a big challenge you're setting there. <laughs> Money against Casca. All right, there you go. So I'm listening to those two words. Um, and now this tweets flow into my Kinesis stream. Behind that Kinesis stream, I have this Lambda functions that look at the hashtags, um, push them in an elastic search appliance. So what I can do is I can actually open up my Kibana tool, which is connected to that elastic search appliance. And I'm just loading up the dashboard. And by now, what you should see is, there we go, there are tweets that are coming in. And I can start visualizing that in my Kibana. So I prepared a little dashboard for this. Just load that up, the tweet dashboard. So here we go. There you go. Some people tweet about money, some about cost cup. This was pretty much expected. <laughs> Um, but it's great. It's a great example that even Costco can even get uh, hashtags that people are tweeting about. Probably somebody was nice to me and just tweeted about it. Um, but this is a great way to visualize it. And you see this is happening in real time. So if I refresh this, you see I only got 404 tweets indexed, 430 tweets indexed, 440 tweets indexed. This is happening in real time to a Kinesis stream. Uh, we see where people are coming from that are tweeting here. So US obviously being a major one here. Um, we see that when people talk about money, Mariazzi is an interesting aura of wealth, actor, Amazon, oh, that's interesting. Um, that's unexpected. And you see this is a real-time demo. Um, I had another function that indexed this also in a DynamoDB table. So let's have a look at how that would look like. So this is actually uh, a website on S3 that has the JavaScript that talks to DynamoDB to get in those tweets and then starts visualizing it um, in D3GS. So let's look at money and see 
how that would look like. Here we go. Money is coming in. Starting feet. Ah. Doesn't want to work on me now. Doesn't want to work on me. So the light this visualization is not working. But um, interestingly, you see as this uh, tweets are coming in, we do now can virtually scale to any amount of uh, tweets that are flowing in. You see the rate right now because I listen uh, to only specific keywords like money or cost cap. Um, there are not so many tweets coming in. And there we go. There are more cost cap tweets coming in. Kibana, by the way, is pretty cool because I could say, well, I want to filter based on topic cost cap. And dive into that a little bit further, and then we see six people tweeted about cost cup in, in, um, in just now, and somebody actually mentioned AWS, so thank you for that. Now, this is just a little live demo that um, I wanted to, to, to show you. Could I get that other mic back? No? There you go. Okay, died on me. All right, I think my laptop died. So that's a perfect live demo or something doesn't work right. So what I wanted to leave you with uh, today is a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, Amazon Web Services has lots of interesting services for your uh, data analytics platform for anything related to scalability, web applications and mobile applications. A lot of those services are specifically designed for a very uh, interesting use case. So don't go out and just do virtual service and do it all yourself. Um, sometimes it makes sense to use a managed service. As a matter of fact, and this is the reason we like to target open source conferences, most of those services are based on open source technology on the, on the underlying layer. Um, apart from that, look at some cool open source tools like Kibana, like FluentD, Integrators. Look at our GitHub page when you use Amazon. We publish a lot of code out there. Um, and one other thing that I wanted to leave you with is upstairs on the fourth floor, we actually got a AWS booth. And we also got a booth challenge there. So you can uh, get lots of interesting goodies if you're able to... Uh, past certain challenges in building up uh, AWS infrastructure. So if you want to try it, uh, you can do it live on our booth. Uh, apart from that, uh, we give everybody of you $50, US dollars, that is, not Taiwan dollars, um, to get started on the platform. So if you bump up by our booth, just fill out a little form, and you get credit codes to try out the platform. If you look at that demo that I just showed you, that Lambda function, that Kinesis stream, if you let that run for a few hours, it might cost you a few cents. And we have an infrastructure that could potentially scale to millions and millions of incoming tweets if you listen to certain words. So that's quite interesting on that part. Now with that, I think my MacBook died. So I uh, thank you very much for your attention, everybody. I'm going to be around to answer some questions. And please feel free to drop by our booth upstairs on the fourth floor. Thank you very much.